Okay, so good morning. Uh, today we will uh, start discussing, I guess for the first time, the details of many body perversion theory. Okay, let me remind you that the main goal of many body perversion theory, MBPT, is to uh, solve the Schrodinger equation for the non-degenerate state, typically the ground state of a many fermion uh, system. Okay, we are assuming that uh, our state psi zero is dominated by some slated terminal phi zero which will serve in our considerations both as a zero order approximation to psi zero as well as the Fermi vacuum for our many body considerations. Okay? And then the purpose of MVPT in a single reference case we are interested in is to simply find what are the other components of the wave function represented in the form of perturbative expansion. So we have the first order correction and then we have various higher order corrections to the wave function and obviously we'll have similar corrections for the energy. So the zero order approximation to it, then first order correction, second order correction, and so on. Okay. Um, Good morning. How are you? Okay. So, um, since phi zero is a Fermi vacuum, we will actually be focusing, as you already know, on solving the Schrodinger equation in the normal product form. Where we are shifting the Hamiltonian and the energy by the expectation value of the, Hamil of the Hamiltonian the unperturbed single determinant of state phi zero. This has uh, several advantages, as you will see computationally, this will actually minimize the number of terms we have to write in various perturbation theory orders, but it also has a nice physical meaning because the difference of the total energy and the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in phi zero is uh, what we often define as the correlation energy, although the strict definition would require that phi zero is a Hartree Fox state. Okay, well then that's how people define correlation energy. Uh, but in our sort of, we'll, we'll, we'll use this term loosely, uh, that is, uh, correlation energy will be defined as anything, as all those physical effects that are beyond the mean field value, okay, uh, beyond the uh, mean field value uh, of the energy obtained with a single determinant even if this determinant is not hard to okay? So we know that our hard to our determinant will be uh, in second quantization, will be, let me start writing some definitions, that we'll need today. So it will be a determinant obtained by choosing some uh, set of uh, spin orbitals, P1 through Pn, to define it. That's another way to write it product of creation operators corresponding to spin orbitals in phi zero acting on the true vacuum. And now what we need to do, that's really the main objective, is to find, uh, 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 find, find out what are the explicit expressions for these various corrections to the energy, to the energy and to the uh, wave function. So I should maybe also complement our energy expansion. So for you know, maybe I'll, uh, so we already have an expansion for psi zero, that can also write somewhere here maybe, that will also represent our delta E zero as a sum of corrections. Of course, you will see actually some of the terms I'm writing now will actually not even contribute, but that is not known to us yet, so I'll write it as a full uh, expansion, where there's a zero order uh, term, the first order correction, the second order correction, and so on, okay? So our, the purpose really of the next few lectures will be to determine what are the explicit formulas for these various perturbative corrections to the wave function and energy uh, or correlation energy uh, and then we'll try to simply learn what they represent physically 
because as you can imagine, if phi zero is R zero, this approximation of the wave function, then all these other corrections must represent contributions from various excited determinants out of phi zero. You know, singles, doubles, triples, and all these other things that contribute to full CI. So this is going to be really an interesting uh, exercise. But of course, there is another purpose in our consideration, namely, we would like to eventually uh, go to our higher orders and then discover linked cluster theorem and then discover Kappa cluster theorem uh, as a consequence uh, of it. Okay. So in order to start, we have to now prepare for the perturbative considerations using everything we know about the rayleigh schrodinger permission theory that we discussed in the last few lectures. Okay? So, um, we have to define several objects. First of all, we have to define the unperturbed problem. Okay? Uh, that is, we have to split our Hamiltonian, which is our operator, K, in when I, you know, the notation I'm using, I used in permission theory, we have to split it into the unperturbed part and the perturbation. Okay? So that's, that's the first goal. As I said last time, if the Hamil since the Hamiltonian in, for a manifold system is the one body part that describes kinetic energies of nucleons, for example, in the nuclear system, or uh, kinetic energies of electrons and interactions of electrons with nuclei in the uh, molecular case, and then the two body part, which describes nuclear nuclear interactions in nuclear physics or electron electron interactions in molecules or of course other interactions if you want to study some other fermions uh, of course Hamiltonian may have more than two body interactions not in quantum chemistry but it can of course happen when you do nuclear physics but I will focus on the case of the two body interactions okay now it's not difficult actually you will see when once you learn MDPT for two body interactions you will see that it's very it's rather straightforward to go actually to three body four, four body portions and so on. So we're not gonna be doing this uh, here in detail because it's it's extremely straightforward based on the knowledge of MDPT for pairwise interactions. Okay. In any case, as I already commented last time, you know, this decomposition of the Hamiltonian sort of implies it suggests that maybe we should just uh, treat Z, the one body part of the Hamil true Hamiltonian as the unperturbed problem and then V as a, as a perturbation, but that's not a good choice because uh, perturbation then would be too big and we would have a hard time converging this ever for any uh, problem of interest. Okay, so we have to do better than that. We have to uh, define our K0 such that we incorporate in it already some information about the interactions, okay, as much as we can essentially, okay, uh, without making it too complicated, all right. So in MDPT, We will define K0 uh, by using the zero of the approximations to the true Hamiltonian, okay, which I will define as Z plus U, where Z is the one body part of the of the Hamiltonian that we already uh, that we of course know. So maybe I'll remind you the second quantized definition over here. The RS are single particle states in our basis, and then uh, I'm just writing the well-known expression to you, okay? So we'll be assuming that we can approximate the true Hamiltonian by the Hamiltonian which consists of Z and U, where U is also a one body operator. So in the second quantization is R, U, S, X, R dagger, X, S which is a, an approximation to a true two-body interaction in the real Hamiltonian, okay? And uh, we know what V is. Maybe I'll also write it so that we have all formulas now uh, spelled out, spelled out. So R, S, V, T, U, X, R dagger, X, S dagger, X, U, X, T, okay. You may of course ask, you know, ask yourself, we, we, we can of course ask the question, how do, how do I find the U, the one body operator, that somehow provides me with an information about the two body interaction? Well, you know, you already know one choice very well. If you just take U to be the G, so maybe that's going to be an example, you know, the uh, contribution to the Fock operator, then of course we already have one good choice. Okay? Uh, 
The fog operator contains information about interactions, okay, in the form of the Coulomb and exchange terms, okay, and uh, that's not, of course, a perfect approximation, but it's definitely a good one already because, typically, because uh, we are providing a, a sort of the uh, information about what is the potential that a fermion feels from an average, uh, you know, an average sort of field uh, of, uh, created by uh, fermions in the system, okay? So in a molecular case, you, you know, uh, hard to talk, of course, tells you uh, what is the uh, sort of uh, potential that an electron feels from other electrons, but in an average sense, not in a detailed sense. Of course, all the details are now in pulse hard to fog considerations. And uh, so we have one choice. But of course, there may be other choices. You can, you know, try to in improve on that G, uh, or you can, you know, choose some part of the sort of, uh, uh, of the hard to fog descriptions or the leading terms of it if you want to simplify things. You know, you can, of course, also rely on some semi-empirical choices. Okay? Um, that is also possible. Okay? There are various Hamiltonians in physics, for example, Haber Hamiltonian and so on, that are actually Hamiltonians where matrix elements are not ab initio calculated, but they are parameterized and they are reasonable to model various phenomena in solid state physics and so on. Also in chemistry, it's a good tradition of semi empirical methods. So we, can, we have all these choices. But of course, one good choice for ab initio work would be Denmark that leads uh, to Z plus G then here, which means the fog. Uh, uh, the hard, the hard to fog level description. Okay, so in first quantization, you may also write it here, uh, you know, because I'll need it, to be written as just uh, the sum of uh, one body terms, uh, little u acting on individual fermions, and then you sum over all the fermions in the system. Okay, so now, now the question, so now you may ask yourself a question, why did I, why did, are we making this choice? I, you know, why don't we make some other choice? Why don't we incorporate, why don't we have some sort of a two body? Interaction already in H naught directly. Okay, well we don't because then we wouldn't know how to solve the arbitrary problem. We have to remember that we are doing using permission theory, and if you know th there is no compact, there is no uh, easy way. Except that, you know, essentially it's impossible to solve the uh, to general two-body problem, right? Okay, uh, such that we know all eigenstates. Okay, our purpose actually is to do it. So we're going to choose the one-body operator to represent our zero approximation. Because we know how, easy, how to find all eigenstates and all eigenvalues of the one-body operator as long as our spin orbital basis set is chosen such that spin orbitals are simply eigenstates of the little z plus little u. Okay? With some uh, spin orbital energies epsilon p. Okay? This is yes. just assuming that the problem is going to be separable. I will prove it now. Okay, uh, I will prove it. So I'm not uh, stating it without a proof. So we have z plus u, psi p, I'll write it also here in the first, quanti first sort of quantized form, uh, gives us epsilon p, psi p, where you know, psi p is simply the single uh, spin orbital uh, corresponding to this uh, p here. Okay, so, all right. So what we'll do now is that we will now prove that indeed it is very easy for us to come up with all eigenstates and all eigen and uh, with all eigenstates of H0 if the spin normal basis that we are using is obtained by solving this uh, eigenvalue problem for the little z plus little u. So in other words, of course, that means that you, when you choose your u, you don't just choose it because you think it's a good approximation to the two-body interaction. You have to choose it such that you now have to solve this eigenvalue problem. Okay, and then once again, if you wonder, do I have good choices for you? Yes, of course. If I choose u to be a g, then z plus u is z plus g, but z plus g is the fog operator, and then we end up with Hartley fog equations. But we know how to solve Hartley fog equations. We already talked about it. We use an SCF procedure, and we have them. So there's at least one good example already in front of our eyes, and that's actually the most popular example, okay, in applications. But you can easily imagine that I can then, if I can do it for one, then I can do it for many, okay? And we can choose other forms of U, right? Uh, which uh, could be related to hard to fog or not. Uh, and, you know, as long as you can solve this problem, we'll be able to find all eigenstates of A0. So let's talk about this, because of course right now this may not be clear yet. Why, how do I know this? Okay, all right. Uh, before I do this, let me also maybe complete the equations that I will use. Well, A0, if you choose uh, well, H0, you know, from our definitions, it is simply a sum of z plus u. If I add up this z and this u, then you end up with a second quantized formula, 
r little z plus little u s and then x r dagger x s sum over r s but if I choose z uh, if I choose our spin orbitals to be eigenstates of z plus u okay then only the diagonal elements here will leave will be will remain so uh, the h0 in this particular basis will have a nice diagonal form which I'm sure all of you, or at least some of you, have seen before, okay? Where the diagonal matrix elements uh, are the only ones that contribute, and those are simply your single particle energies or spin orbital energies uh, relevant to the problem. Uh, okay, so let's now prove that indeed we know the eigenstates of H0 in this case uh, right away. What are they? Can you suggest actually? What should I say? What will be the eigenstates of A0? Can you sort of guess it? Straight determinants. Okay? All straight determinants in a, you know, that are obtained from this single particle basis. Okay? Phi. So I write a typical straight determinant. Okay? I write, also write it in, a, in some other, you know, other forms that we used in, the, in this class. Okay, that's an anti-symmetrized product of the Qs, and then in second quantization, that's the product of creation operators acting on the true vacuum. We will now prove that indeed any Slater determinant okay, is an eigenstate of H0 with the energy with the corresponding energy. I'm going to write it as E0, Q1 through Qn. Those Qs are the same that you have in the determinant. So where this E0 quantity is simply the sum of single particle energies epsilon Q1 plus epsilon Qn that correspond to what to the slate spin orbitals q1 through qn in the determinant. Okay? I'll also write it here more symbolically so that you are you get used to all these notational aspects of our work. Okay? So I'm summing here epsilon q gammas over gamma from 1 to n. Okay? That's the same as Alright. Well let's prove it. The proof you know, can be done in two different ways. Um, well, okay, let's try. Hopefully I've not uh, you know, one way is enough usually to prove anything, right? But I'll, I'll show you two proofs. Uh, uh, hopefully this can be done reasonably fast. So let's see, proof, let's call it proof one. Proof one will be based on the very elementary argument, uh, or, or, uh, which is based on the first quantization, just you know, a standard coordinate representation uh, of all the objects, okay? So let's write it here, first quantization. So how does the proof go then? You start with H0, you want to apply it on a determinant. Okay, well in first quantization, determinant is a function of all coordinates of fermions that we have in a system. Okay? Well, H0 is, this, is z plus u, okay? So in first quantization, it's simply a sum of little z acting on xi plus little u acting on xi xi being coordinates of uh, fermion i, okay, and then acting on the determinant, okay, remember what the determinant is, determinant is, as, you know, we, we talked about it in the initial classes, it's a square root of the n factorial, the un idempotent anti-symmetrizer a acting on the product of spin orbitals, psi q1 x1 through psi q n x n, okay, so we're coming back to essentially the beginning of, of this class uh, in this consideration, and of course I have to sum over i from 1 to n, okay? So that's, the, uh, well, that's the Hamiltonian part. Well, we know that our, this expression is, a, you know, is symmetric with respect to permutations of permutations. In other words, I can take, uh, let's see if I can use some color, I can take the This part here, 
and write it in front of our expression. Square root of the refactor is a number, so you can always take it out. And then, as I said, anti-symmetrizer commutes with uh, the H0. So I can write it as square root of the refactorial, anti-symmetrizer. And then I have a summation over i from 1 to n. We have z x i plus u x i. OK? Acting on the product. Psi q r x 1. Psi q, I will now emphasize psi q i. OK? So you have psi q i minus 1, x i minus 1. Psi q i x i. Psi q i plus 1, x i plus 1. And then some dots. Psi q n, x n. OK? Well, let's think about this expression. For a given value of i in the summation, z plus u, okay, that we have here, will act on this particular spin orbital only, nothing else. Okay? Maybe I'll also mark it so that you will remember this. So this operator for a given value of i acts only on psi qi, okay, in this expression. So you can stick it here, all right? And then you can use the fact that psi q's are eigenstates of z plus u by definition. In other words, we know that z x i plus u x i, okay, acting on psi q i x i gives you epsilon q i times psi q i x i. That's from our, this information comes from our choices here of how our single positive states are defined. Well, with this, I can then say that when I continue our calculation here, I will end up with square root of the n factorial, anti-symmetrizer, sum over i from 1 to n. I'm going to then replace z plus u acting on psi qi by epsilon qi times psi qi. So I will end up with psi q1 x1 psi q i minus 1 x i minus 1 then you have psi q i x i psi q i plus 1 x i plus 1 and then psi q n x n okay now here you have a product of all spin orbitals in our original determinant okay well, I, this is just the sum of numbers, okay, the speed of energies. So what I can do now, I can complete the calculation by simply taking this part of our expression and moving it over here, in front of our product. But square root of the factorial, anti-symmetrizer, and the product of all spin rules is simply our state determinant, phi, coming back. Okay, so we end up with a sum of epsilon q uh, i, where i goes from 1 to n, of phi q1 qn x1 xn, which completes the proof. We just demonstrated that h0 acting on the determinant phi q1 through qn gives us the sum of the spiral energies times that determinant. Okay? And you can see the proof does not really require uh, high level knowledge. It's a, it's a, it's a basic quantum mechanics. But let's sort of, you know, since we're in this class uh, using second quantization, we're very happy about second quantization. So let's sort of see how the same proof would go if I chose to use second quantization as uh, our way to prove things. Okay, so proof number two, which will be second quantization. A good practice. Okay. Well, in that case, I don't know if I already erased it. Not. No. In this case, as oh, 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 oh. so we still have the basic definitions visible to us. In this case, if, as I said already, the Hamiltonian H zero can be written in this way. Okay, where we only have diagonal matrix elements defined by single partial energy epsilon r. So I'm going to use this information. So I, will, so I will now apply H0 to a determinant, okay? And then for the H0, I'm going to use this uh, second quantized representation where you have a summation over 
spinor of r, epsilon r, x r dagger x r, this is h0, okay? And then for the determinant, I will use its second quantized representation, which is a product of creation operators xq1 dagger through xqn dagger acting on the true vacuum, okay? Well, as you can see what I have here in this expression, I have a product of these two operators acting on another product, all acting then on the true vacuum, okay? So let me do a little calculation on the side, okay, which will be a calculation of xr dagger xr acting on the product of xq1 dagger through xqn dagger acting on the uh, vacuum. Okay, well, you know, this is a product of operators acting on the vacuum, which is a perfect candidate for the work based on uh, Weeks theorem. Okay? So, Weeks theorem, though, relative to the true vacuum, because that's what I had. So, as you remember, the leading term is the normal product, lowercase m, because we are in the regime of the true vacuum, being our reference here. So, it's a normal product of xr dagger xr. Then we have xq1 dagger through xqn dagger, and then acting on the vacuum. That's the leading term. And then we will have terms that contain contractions. Well, before I write them, let's try to determine which contractions. You remember, first of all, this part here is already in the normal product form, the lowercase normal product form. Okay? So it's already the, I write it here as n form. This is, of course, also in the normal product form, because we only have creation operators. Okay? So that means that if I want to contract, I have to contract between the two groups using generalized weak theorem. But also we know that the only non-zero contractions that uh, uh, are of the x x dagger type. So I really have to contract x r with some operator here, and I have to do it in all possible ways. So I will end up with a summation. I write it as a summation over say gamma from one to n, okay? And I have a normal product of x r dagger x r xq1 dagger, xq gamma dagger, xqn dagger, all acting on the vacuum, okay, where x, where the q gamma operator here is the one contracted with xr. So you see I'm contracting xr with xq gamma dagger, and then I'm running over all gamma values to make sure that I have all the contractions. And there are, there's nothing else. There will be no dual, double contractions, triple contractions, they will all be zero, because uh, all the other contractions are simply zero. All right? So, let's first look at the first term a little bit. That term is very straightforward to calculate, so I'll not actually rewrite it, I'll just say that this one, if you really think about what it is, what I can do, I can take this annihilation operator here, and I can move it inside the normal product in front. Okay? When I do that, I will introduce the sine factor of minus 1 to the n, and then I will have a normal product of x r dagger. Maybe I'll write it below. You don't have to do anything. Shorter arrow here. So it's minus 1 to the n. We have a normal product of x r dagger, x q1 dagger, through x q n dagger, and then x r at the very end, acting on the vacuum. But you know very well that XR, the annihilation operator, annihilates the vacuum. Okay, so we know that this term will not contribute. It's a zero. So I don't have to even continue writing it. All right, well, that means that I, uh, it's a good thing. You know, we can also, we, we have to focus on the term with the summations over contractions. Okay, so let's uh, deal with them now. Okay. So when I continue here, our xr dagger xr acting on the product of creation operators, defining the determinant, gives us a summation over gamma from 1 to n. Okay, and now let's see what do we get. Well, first of all, what you have to do is, you know, you have to take the contractions out. The easiest way to do it here is take this q gamma operator, move it gamma minus one times over here so they become nearest neighbors, and then take the nearest neighbors out. You know, when you take nearest neighbors out, then you don't change the sign, okay? Uh, but to make them nearest neighbors, I have to do gamma minus one jump. So that's a phase factor of minus one to the gamma minus one. 
And then I have a contraction XR, XQ, gamma, dagger. And then I am left with uh, the remaining operators which are uncontracted. So I have XR dagger, XQ1 dagger, then we have XQ gamma minus 1 dagger, XQ gamma plus 1 dagger, you know, this is a place from which uh, XQ gamma dagger originated. Okay, and then we have XQ n dagger, all of this acting on the vacuum. Okay. Well, so then continuing, we have a summation over gamma from 1 to n, we have this phase factor, minus 1 to the gamma minus 1. Well, the value of this contraction is the chronicle delta, delta RQ gamma, we already know this. And then what I'll do, I'll do one more thing, that is, to complete this calculation, that is, I will take this operator, XR dagger, and I'll put it where XQ gamma dagger was, okay? To do this, I have to perform gamma minus one jumps, so then we'll introduce another factor, minus one to the gamma minus one, and then we'll have a normal product of XQ one dagger through XQ uh, gamma minus one dagger, then we'll have XR dagger where Q gamma was, then we have XQ gamma plus one dagger through XQ n dagger, all acting on the vacuum. Now, we can now, you can see that, uh, well, the phase factors cancel out, so that's a good thing. All right? But there's one more thing we can also do, that is we can replace R here by Q gamma. Why? Because there's a chronicle delta. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether I call it R or Q gamma. When I do this, we end up with a sum over gamma from 1 to n, delta r q gamma, and then we have a normal product of all operators, x q 1 dagger through x q n dagger, okay, acting on the vacuum because I replaced r by q gamma, so now you have them back in the same order as they came in, okay? But that is, of course, a straight determinant, okay, because I can drop the n, and that's a straight determinant, okay? So we end up with a sum over gamma, from 1 to n, delta r, q gamma, slave determinant phi, q1, through qn. Okay, well, that's nice, because now we can take this result and stick it back in our calculation of a zero acting on the determinant. Okay? So what do we get? H0 acting on a determinant. As you remember, what we had here was a summation over epsilon r, over R, and then we have uh, the pair XR dagger XR acting on X dagger, which we already worked out. We obtained a summation over gamma from 1 to N, delta RQ gamma, okay, phi Q1 QN, all right? So, all I can, you know, now it's a simple, uh, uh, bunch of tricks at the end, you know, we just, uh, you know, we can write summations in any order we want, so I'm going to start with a summation over gamma from 1 to n, and please note that the summation over r will be eliminated because of the delta, okay, the delta will limit the summation over r to one term only, r equal q gamma, so we end up with epsilon q gamma, okay, times p, and this completes the proof, okay. This completes the proof that tells us that uh, indeed uh, H, the determinants are eigenstates of H0 with eigenvalues defined by the sum of all the single particle energies epsilon, okay, corresponding to a determinant. Well, this is actually a case where I think the first quantization derivation was actually quicker than this one, but it's a good practice also to just to show that these things work. Okay, so. Well, what do we do next? So now we proved a very important statement, okay? We proved that indeed, with our choice of H0, we know all eigenstates. With our choice, I should say, of H0 and the basis set, okay? Diagonalizing little z plus little u, we know how to, and we know that uh, all, uh, all straight determinants that, that our basis set produces are eigenstates. 
So what do you do next? Next, you choose one of these determinants then as your approximation to psi zero. Okay? Now the question is which one? You have many of them, right? Well, you know, the, if, you know since th this is mostly you know, applicable to the ground state problem, a typical choice would be to choose a determinant corresponding to the lowest values of spinoral energies epsilon. Okay? Simply. So if you do it, if your physio is a hard to fog determinant, for example, well, then your choice will be pick up, you know, just, you know, then your, uh, uh, you know, then of course, you know, those will be the lowest, that's what we call a hard to fog determinant, right? It's, we're going to just pick up the determinant, which is a hard to fog determinant corresponding to the lowest uh, uh, orbital energies, okay, that we have. But, you know, we're not constrained in this way. You know, it may happen that you know a little bit more about your particular state. You know, it may happen that you know that your state is actually not dominated by, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the lowest uh, single particle states, but it, for example, has uh, maybe most of them are lowest, but then there are some that we have to pick up on some uh, uh, higher uh, single particle states uh, set, right? Uh, you know, the typical choice would be, of course, the symmetry. You know, if the symmetry tells you, okay, maybe I should pick up some other higher, you know, orbit, right, uh, to define my determinant, I can do this. Maybe I want to compute an excited state. You know, there may be some small, you know, it's a small manifold, but there may be some excited state. Okay, that may be really dominated by a determinant for some reason. Okay, I would say it's a very small manifold of all the excited states, so I would say that this is, this is a usual unlikely. But you know, but you have that choice. So, so I'm not going to simply say, okay, right now, which exactly single particle state will pick up because we know what to do. Typically, you pick up spin orbitals to build our unperturbed state. You pick up spin orbitals that correspond to the smallest values of epsilon of the spin, spin orbital energies. Okay. Uh, but we are not con not really limited in permission to do this. So I will simply say that phi zero is a determinant obtained by picking up some subset of n spin orbitals p1 through pn that we believe provide a good representation of our problem. Okay. So then this is going to be our Fermi vacuum. Okay, and this is going to also to be our zero order state. So that means that we can start using the particle hole, whole particle formalism, and we can then represent all the remaining determinants in terms of excitations out of phi zero. That phi zero that you choose, okay, uh, as our zero order state. So then we have phi i a, which is x a dagger x i, acting on phi zero where i here belongs to p1, the set of p1 to pn, okay? And then a's are simply different than p1 to pn. And then we have double excitations, p i j a b, which is x a dagger x i, x b dagger x j, acting on phi, zero, Okay, and then of course in general we have n duply excited determinants phi i1 through i little n, a1 through a little n, which are simply products of x dagger x pairs, x dagger a gamma, x i gamma acting on phi zero, where gamma in the product runs from one to little n. Okay, and of course our n here in general starts from one, those are singles, then doubles. And it stops at capital N, which is simply defined by phi zero. Okay, then we know exactly how many particles we have. Okay? Alright, so my next goal really will be to do something really, I would say, elementary, but still useful. That is, since we will choose phi zero to be our Fermi vacuum, and we'll choose, we'll then represent all other determinants that are also eigenstates of H0 as excitations of phi zero, it's good for us to write expressions for energies that go with these determinants using this notation of excited determinants or particle hole excitations, okay? So let's start with H0. Well, H0, that's easy, okay? With this notation, you know, I get sum of energies epsilon P1 plus epsilon Pn, we just proved it, times V0, okay? So I will, this is that means that the sum of energies 
single particle energy corresponding to uh, spin orbitals in phi zero will define our unperturbed energy E zero, okay, at the level of H zero. Of course, we're not done yet with defining K zero. Remember, we're still dealing with the zero order approximation to H, not to HN. Uh, but that's, that, that will be very easy once we figure this one out. Well, what about singles? Okay? So let's sort of, I'm going to still use the notation with the, you know, where I use P's and Q's. So let's imagine that I want to excite P gamma into Q gamma, okay? P gamma in our phi zero into Q gamma. And I would like to have some nice compact formula for the energy in terms of excitation I'm performing rather than the sum of all spin energies. Well, let's try to figure this out. So it's going to be epsilon P1 plus plus epsilon P gamma minus 1. And now where P gamma was, you will have epsilon Q gamma, okay? That's the replacement that we have in our determinant, plus epsilon P gamma plus 1, plus then all the rest of them, epsilon P n, okay? Times our determinant, okay? This is, we already know this, because we know, we proved, we just proved that the energy corresponding to the determinant Okay, is simply sum of spin orbital energies. Okay, I just replace p gamma here by q gamma. But I will now do a simple trick, addition to subtraction, so I'll write it as epsilon q gamma minus epsilon p gamma, okay, and then I'll stick p gamma here. Okay, so you have epsilon p1 plus, plus epsilon p gamma minus 1 plus epsilon p gamma plus epsilon p gamma plus 1 plus dot epsilon pn, okay? And we close the bracket. And then times the determinant. Well, you can clearly see here that you have a spin energy difference corresponding to the excitation in the phi. And then what you have here is the sum of all spin energies in phi zero, okay? This is what I call E zero here. So we just demonstrated a very nice formula that H0 acting on the singly substituted determinant P gamma going into Q gamma equals epsilon Q gamma minus epsilon P gamma plus the energy of our reference determinant okay, times our single XR determinant. Okay? That's the formula. Well, let's check maybe one more. Okay, let's just check how double excitation would look like in this language, in this situation. Okay, so what if I try to apply H0 to a doubly excited determinant? P gamma, say P, I don't know, delta, going into Q gamma, Q delta, okay? Just to see again if I can do something simple about it. So first of all, we know it's going to be a sum of energies in this determinant, which I will write as follows. It's going to be epsilon P1 plus, plus epsilon P gamma minus 1. Now, instead of P gamma, I have to write here Q gamma because I have a substitution. Okay? So, again, I'll mark it perhaps. So, we know where the substitution is. Then we have epsilon P gamma plus 1 dot. Then the next uh, substitution is the delta. Okay? So, we have epsilon p delta minus 1 plus epsilon q delta because I perform a substitution of p delta into q delta okay, by q delta, so you know, that's, what, that's the next uh, uh, substitution and then we have plus epsilon p delta plus 1 plus dot all the other ones p uh, n, right? Okay, close the bracket and times p the double excited P, P gamma, P delta, going into Q gamma, Q delta. Well, again, the same trick. And add and subtract, okay? So how I can write this energy expression? I can write it as epsilon Q gamma minus epsilon P gamma <coughs> plus epsilon Q delta minus epsilon P delta, okay? And then replace Q gamma here by P gamma and P delta here by Q delta here by P delta. Is this clear to everybody? Simple trick. Then I end up here with a summation of all energies in phi zero. Okay, so I will not maybe keep rewriting this in a long way. I'll just say it's going to be E zero here. All right? Acting <coughs> the times the 
that the exact determinant that we have here, p gamma, p delta, q gamma, q delta. Okay? <coughs> Is this clear? You know, so you can see that there's some nice rule emerging out of it. H0 acting on the excited determinant is giving us the energy, which is E0, the energy of the reference determinant, plus the single particle excitations measured by simply over the You know, many people call them excited energy, actually, right? no, but that's wrong. Because there's correlation to excited states. Yeah? That's a very poor approximation to an excited state energy. But anyway, they are sort of physically speaking energy differences that correspond to excitations of the fermions uh, in the determinant. Okay, so now I would like to, of course I could repeat it for triples, quadruples, and so on. So I'm not going to do this, obviously. I'll, I'll just now write the final formula, maybe we'll do a little break. Okay, so let's summarize these considerations. Let's now switch to our proper notation for the particle hole excitations, okay? The one that we're really interested in. So, we can write that, that if I apply H0 to phi IA, okay? I end up with epsilon A minus epsilon I plus E0, okay? And then phi IA, okay? If I do this for a double excited determinant, phi ij becoming ab, where ij are occupied in phi zero, ab are unoccupied in it, then we end up with epsilon a minus epsilon i plus epsilon b minus epsilon j, okay, plus e zero, phi ij ab, okay, and I can continue in this way. So before I continue, let me introduce a, a sort of a Compact notation that in general, so you can say etc. So in general, I will, when I write the script, capital case energy E, okay, I1 through IN, A1 through AN here, defined, uh, you, know, that, you know, if I write something like this, what I will mean by that is a sum of single spinomial energy differences that correspond to excitations in this symbol epsilon, I mean script A, E, I should say, okay? So we have here epsilon A, N minus epsilon I, N, okay? Plus E, zero, okay? So I'm defining, just not to write these long expressions, I'm defining the energy of a determinant corresponding to n tuple excitations from I's to A's, as a sum of E0, the energy of the ground state determinant, of, of the reference determinant phi 0 and the differences of spinoral energies that correspond to an excitation, okay, that we are dealing with here. In this notation, we can summarize our considerations as follows. We can say that H0 acting on phi 0 is E0 P0, where E0 is the sum of epsilon P, say gamma, where gamma goes from 1 to n. Okay, those are the, this is your reference energy, okay, corresponding to phi 0 Then for the, all the other ones, H0 acting on phi IA gives us the new symbol epsilon IA phi IA, where maybe I'll write it for this case is, uh, you know, it's according to our definition, it's epsilon A minus epsilon I plus E0. So it's a shift, okay? Shift of the excitation energy by E0. And in general, if I want to know what is the energy of a determinant obtained by an n-fold excitation, I1, In into A1, An, I can say that it's going to be the simple epsilon, this is sorry, script E, I1 through I n times a determinant phi I1 through I n A1 through A n. Okay? So we can you can you know that's how our Ampere problem at the level of the standard form Hamiltonian looks like. Okay? 
we have a very easy access, trivial almost, access to all ground and excited states of H0 by simply writing all the determinants, pick up one of them to be your reference determinant for many body considerations, all the other ones are particle like full excitations from it, and the formulas for energies are trivial. You know, essentially they correspond to differences of spiral energies corresponding to a given excitation shifted by the energy of the reference determinant E0. Okay, so perhaps, uh, yeah, let's have a little break, five minutes at this point. Okay, we'll, re we'll, we'll continue at uh, 10.30 and, uh, sorry, 9.30, not that long. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, well, then we'll move on very quickly to the operation operator. Do you also work for the teaching center? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. I have some other classes. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. This is very good. So thank you for doing this. Yeah, no problem. So how's she all doing? She. Oh, she's just not feeling too well. Uh, so okay. yeah. Okay. So please wish her best of luck. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see her for this. Did you get my email about the midterm? I said it yesterday night. Yes. Yeah. Well, I said it actually was mostly about homework, right? Uh, uh, and I reminded about it. So, homework. So, I resorted the last homework. I will release solutions of the number five today when I collect all the homework. So, I have a few people that slept by 5 p.m. their time. Okay. So as I said in this uh, I mentioned already, we will be, you know, the material covered will be everything prior to perturbation T. Okay? Because you know we'll still have another exam so I can test the rest of the material on the, on the final exam. Um, I'm you know I expect roughly speaking five problems, something like this, that are geared, you know, toward to our exam. Actually, you can, you know, if you really, you know, know the material and you sort of can write fast enough, you know, right? Fast. No, 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 you know, fast enough meaning not extremely fast, okay, not some sort of uh, unphysical speed, right? Uh, no, just uh, fast enough in a sense that you are not stuck, like, thinking, you know, 10 minutes about what the next line should be, right? Because, of course, that happens, you slow down yourself, right? But if you sort of know, okay, I know what to do, so you start writing, and, you know, then it's, you know, probably an hour, right? but, but, you know, of course, I can assume that everybody will write the next line so quickly, right? You have to give it a little thought, right? So it's going to be hours. But as I said, we have yeah. no reserve for three hours, really. So we need to go beyond that. That's right. I would argue that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the And the type of problem, you know, the problems in terms of the therapy, what they are, and so they will be not, not any different than your homework, right? So you're used to the homework, I go back now. Processing five of them, right? So you know that it sort of um, derives something, right? Uh, you know, there's a formula and so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, of course, students may always ask the question, well, what is that I need to know and what is it or remember and what is that I don't need to remember, right? Well, uh, you know, you know, you need to know weak theorem. I'm not going to tell you what weak theorem is, right? And so on and so forth. But if, you know, but uh, for operators, if I, because I want to make sure that everybody uses a consistent notation, then I will define myself operator equals, right? And I'll, so I'm not going to tell you, well, there's some two the operator, you have to figure out what notation you're going to use for it, right? You know, I'll tell you what it is. Like in, you know, in homework, I always say Z and equals, and I tell you because I want to make sure that everybody uses similar notation, so it's all organized and so on, okay? So you need to know, you know, contractions, weeks, theorem, normal products, 
you know, of course, remember that we did it twice, you know, so we have to know how these things are defined relative to the true vacuum, then relative to the Fermi vacuum, okay? Then that means that we have to know the whole particle formulas, right? And then, of course, there are diagrams, you know, we talk about diagrammatic language, Goldstone diagrams, Huygens diagrams, uh, uh, rules, you know, the, how to determine them, right? Uh, you know, uh, and remember about this procedure. You know, any question I ask, if I ask a question about Huygens diagrams, you know what to do. You just uh, go through our procedures, skeletons, okay, throw arrows, get your uh, Huygens diagrams, and then represent each Huygens diagram by randoms. Follow this procedure. Just don't try to do something else because it's just an unnecessary uh, slowdown in your work, right? And then for the goldstones, again, use Huygens holes as an intermediate step and do line exchanges. If there is a question like this, then do that. Okay. Don't try to build goldstone diagrams from goldstone vertices because it's too much work. Okay, right. So you know, so you know, now we're at the level where I, you know, we, after I walked you through it, you know, we, we went through through goldstone kind of slowly, taking it easy and kind of trying to, well, easy, but anyway, we try, we try to certainly go, you know, build the intuitions. But once you build the intuitions and you prove all the theorems, then you end up with a final procedure, right? So then you use the final procedure. You don't have to go back to what we're talking about, where we're introducing these concepts. Okay. Okay, so I guess we can restart, right? Okay, so we are at the level where we have an eigenvalue problem, the unpredictable eigenvalue problem almost set up. Okay, we have it set up at the level of H0, which is an approximation to the Hamiltonian H in the standard form. Okay, so now we're going to take the important step. We're going to say what is K0, you know, the unperturbed part of the Hamiltonian we're really interested in. Okay, remember that our Hamiltonian of interest in the Schrodinger equation we are, we are considering here is Hn. So we're going to be trying now to define K0. Well, what is Hn? Well, Hn is H minus the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, okay, in phi zero. So it is all natural to simply shift the uh, uh, to shift uh, H0 by the expectation value of it to define k0. You know, that is performing exactly the same type of a trick. Okay? So we are going to define, and that's not very important. Okay? k0 as h0 that we already defined and worked, out, worked on, minus phi0, h0, phi0. Okay? So in other words, we're building also the normal product form of h0. What is phi0, h0, phi0? Maybe you can tell me. What do you think this is? E0, exactly. So, you know, we are shifting our Hamiltonian H0 that we uh, considered so far by the energy of the reference determinant phi0, okay? Well, when you do this, so now I would like to use this information to spell out our eigenstates and eigenvalues of K0. Well, okay, I still keep this, you know, kept, kept this for a reason, okay? I want you to look at it now, okay? And let's start writing. So what is K0 acting on phi0? Since K0 is obtained by shifting H0, you have to go here and shift this problem by E0. When you do this, on the right-hand side, you get a 0. Okay? So actually, our ground, our eigenvalue, unperturbed eigenvalue, kappa 0, let me write it formally like this, will be 0. You see this? This is beautiful. So we're really interested in what's outside E0. Okay? by doing uh, this normal ordering trick. Okay, what is then K0 acting on phi i a? Well, again, we go back here. Can you, uh, excuse me, do you uh, follow me when I sometimes, because I'm moving around between backwards. So when we go here, okay, we're gonna be shifting this by E0. So I have to subtract E0. When I do, I just end up with this part. Okay, so that means that our unperturbed Eigenvalue kappa i a is simply epsilon a minus epsilon i. Okay? So then in general, if I want to say what is the eigenvalue corresponding to the n tuply excited determinant, i1 i n through a1 a n, I'm going to write it as kappa i1 i n a1 a n okay times phi i1 i n a1 a n what is then the kappa we have here 
as you can see, we go back to the previous blackboard, you can see that it is, uh, okay, now we have it on the top blackboard, so you could uh, so show for a moment the top blackboard here, top left. We have this energy plus E0. Now we are subtracting E0, so it's going to be this part. Okay? Just the sum of single particle energy differences corresponding to the excitation we're dealing with here. So it's going to be simply a sum over gamma from 1 to n, sorry, to little n, I should say, and epsilon a gamma minus epsilon i gamma. Okay? So what I'm doing here, I'm just adding epsilon a1 minus epsilon i1, epsilon a2 minus epsilon i2, and so on, up to epsilon an minus epsilon i n. Okay? A very simple definition. Those will be uh, the famous perturbative denominators that you will see in MVPT. So to conclude our discussion, okay, maybe I'll put this up. Make sure that I didn't do any damage. To conclude this, what is K0 in terms of our operator Z and U that we were using? K0 is Z plus U for H0 minus the expectation value of Z plus U in phi 0 But you remember from our previous classes that Z minus the expectation value of Z is Zn. U is also a one-body operator. So U minus expectation value of U is Un. Okay? So you can see that our K0 operator is simply the Z plus U in the normal product form. Remember, please, this information. Okay? All right, so now we're done, and we need to go to perturbation. You see, as I said already last time, NDPT is not like any other, maybe not any other, but like sort of these textbook examples of perturbation theory, where you sort of know you're perturbing a problem, you know, with some field, say Zeeman effect, or something like this, right? Stark effect, or, you know, a harmonic oscillator, and so on, so forth. So you start with something which is well known, analytically solvable, and then you modify it. That's not how we work here. We start with the real Hamiltonian, real Hamiltonian, not some, you know, whatever we think about it, okay? The real Hamiltonian that you, you know, to the best of your knowledge, right? In chemistry that's easier, in your physics that's a little tricky, but you know, surely you're going to build the best Hamiltonian you can provide, then we subtract from it the unperturbed part, and that's going to be our perturbation, okay? So it's a different way of thinking. It's going to be a realistic description uh, in that sense, okay? So let's talk about this. So let's not talk about perturbation, try to understand. So, erase. Okay, so perturbation. A little section here, perturbation. Okay, so we know that K is K0 plus W. We already defined K0. Okay, so what is W then? Well, W is K minus K0. Okay, what is K? K is Z plus V in, 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 the, in the description we're following, right? K0 is Z plus U. Okay? Furthermore, so, sorry, uh, no, I'm writing this wrong. Please never mind for a second. K is defined as H, I should have said this, minus P0, H, P0, because K is a normal product form of the Hamiltonian. And K0 is defined as H0 minus the expectation value of H0. So when I now subs, and we know that H of course is Z plus V, okay? And we know that H0 is Z plus U, okay? So when I substitute all this information, I can very quickly come up with the formula for W. So W is, it is um, H minus h0 minus uh, h0 minus the expectation value of phi0 h minus h0 phi0 right you can see that uh, w is k okay minus k0 so i'm writing k which is h minus expectation value of it that's this part and this part and then minus uh, the we have to subtract k0 which is h0 minus expectation value of it okay now we have to substitute for h and uh, h0, for h we write z plus v, for h0 we'll write z plus u, 
Okay? And then I do the same in the expectation value expression. Okay, so we have h minus z, h0, which is z plus v minus z plus u. Well, as you can see, the one body part, z, cancel out. Okay, so z cancels out with this one. Okay, and we have the same cancellation in, 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 the, in the, uh, our uh, expectation value. Okay, so our w becomes... becomes uh, v minus u minus an expectation value of v minus u. Well, let's try to understand this. Remember, v is a two-body operator. Two-body operator can be written as vn, the normal product form of it, plus gn, plus an expectation value of it. So if you subtract expectation value of v from, from v, okay, then you end up with vn plus gn. Now, you have here, that's because V is two body, so it has the GN part, where, and maybe I'll remind you, GN is, the, is defined as a summation of, uh, say, P, I don't know, J, V, Q, J, and the symmetrized normal product of X, P, dagger, X, J, X, Q. Okay? So it sum over P, Q. That's our G operator that is that part of out of theory, as we discussed it before. Okay. But then I have the U. U minus expectation value of U. U is one body. So U equals expectation value of it plus UN. So that means that U, U minus expectation value is UN is UN. So you subtract UN here. Okay? That's our formula for the perturbation operator. Well, let's try to understand it. Okay? So maybe I should also say that what is un? Un is the summation over pq, uh, p, little u, q, right? Normal product of x p dagger x q. So it's a it's a normal product form of our operator u being an approximation, some sort of a, 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 a some sort of a one body representation of the two body interactions in a system. Okay. Let's try to understand. So, well, clearly we can see the following. And that's very important now. There are two parts of this operator, perturbation operator. Okay? There is a two body part, and there is a one body part, obtained by the combining G and U. So, I'm going to write it accordingly. I'm going to now write W as the one body part plus the two body part. Well, the one body part is defined here as GN minus un, okay? We're going to call this operator from now on qn, okay? And qn is defined then uh, in second quantization. Maybe I'll, I'll go back to these letters r and s that I used before. So rqs, normal product of x r dagger xs, summed over rs, where we define little q to be simply a little g, Minus little u that are behind our operators g and uh, g and u n. Okay. Well, then the two and the two body part is simply v n. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time talking about the two body part because it's a normal product form of our uh, real interaction in, in in a system. Okay. But what is new here? Okay. So all you know for v n, if I want to define it, all I need to write is one half sum over r s t u. Uh, R S V T U a normal product of X R dagger X uh, T X S dagger X U for example if I write it this way okay but what is new here is the presence of this one body piece that originates from uh, our assumption what H zero is and what uh, what uh, uh, you know what is the normal order form of the, uh, uh, of V, okay? Let's try to understand. Well, first of all, you already see something here. This operator here measures the discrepancy between your choice of the one-body operator U and the what hartley fock theory provides, okay? That comes from normal ordering of V, okay? 
So this means that, you know, and actually you can see it in multiple ways. You know, let me write it in this W1 in a different different way. Perhaps, uh, let's see, I have a few of them here. So how about if I do this? It's Gn minus Un. So how about if I write it as Zn plus Gn, okay, minus Zn plus Un, okay? And then addition and subtraction, right? Zs will cancel, you have Gn minus Un. But this is a useful thing to, to write because then Zn plus Gn is a focal breaker, okay? Fn, okay? So then, and then we have z plus u in a normal platform, which is our unperturbed uh, problem, okay? So, in other words, the fog operator here is the sum of over rs, r, f, s, normal product of x, r dagger, x, s, okay? Where f is the fog operator, uh, okay, maybe I'll write it also, little z plus little g, okay? All right. So in this way, you can see that the one-body part emerges there if your u is not, you know, is, is different than the g operator of particle field. Okay. You can also write a few other equations. Maybe I'll write a few of them because it's good to see. You. How about if I write this one? Let's write it more explicitly. So what is then w1 in terms of matrix elements? Well, it's going to be a summation over Rs. Let me right away write the final result because this is trivial. Rfs minus epsilon r delta rs, okay, times the normal product of x r dagger xs. How do I get this? You know, you look at definitions. Fn, well, I have fn here, this matrix element of f, and this gives us me fn. And this is simply, you know, this is simply r z plus u s, okay, because we are assuming that our spinorbitals diagonalize z plus u, right? So you end up with, you know, they are, you know, you end up with epsilon, the corresponding energy, times the delta, okay? So we are learning now that our W1 measures the discrepancy between your choice of u, operator representing two-body interaction at the one-body level, and what normal ordering provides for you, okay? Well, that's very important, because that actually shows you how important the fog operator is. But fog operator is not just important in Hartley fog theory. It really kind of sets the bar. Okay? If I choose, if phi zero is a Hartley fog state, I write HF, right there, I think we used that acronym before. Okay? Well, that means that F, which is Z plus U, which is Z plus G, equals z plus u, right? Because that's what it means. Which means that we're choosing g to be u, and if you choose g to be u, that q, that q operator there, that defines the one-body part of the perturbation is zero. Okay? Well, in this specific case, w1 is zero, okay? Because w1 is uh, qn, maybe I should write it, w1, which is normally qn, okay, is zero. Because little q is now zero, because we're not trying to deviate in this case from Arctic fog, we're just using Arctic fog, okay? And then the only part of the perturbation is the two-body part, okay? That's the choice which is sometimes called, I'll come back to this, manner pleasant perturbation theory, okay? Then we say NPPT, not MBPT, okay? This is, this stands for manner pleasant who were the first people who used perturbation theory to study correlation around 1930. Okay, so it's not the 50s when MBPT was really considered. It was already the 30s. Okay, it's amazing, you know, how the progress was, okay? Well, what happens then in this case? Let me continue, because that's an interesting case. So if we are in this better lesser regime, okay, Well then, in a better blessed regime, things begin to look familiar, actually. Because in this case, so in MTPT, okay, W1 is 0, W2 is Vn, what is K0? K0 is, you remember, it was Zn plus Un, but if U is G, then it's Zn plus Gn, 
What is dn plus gn? It's a fog operator in the normal product form. You remember when we were talking about splitting hn? At some point that hn equals fn plus bn? You see, if you use Hartley-Fox state as your reference, then you can simply rely on this natural decomposition of H. That will be a zero part, the fog part, and this will be your perturbation. Okay? A beautiful theorem. Very simple. No one body thing, right? So Mellon Blessed already sort of understood this. Okay? Because Hartley Fock is the best determinant, energetically speaking. So it's it's not no nobody should be surprised that we're gonna be choosing this quite often, right? In calculations. But of course I don't we don't want to be constrained in this way. That's where physicists, you know, the Melbourne are actually physicists too, but that's where the, you know, the Brackner, Goldstone, and physicists of this generation, you know, introduced. They said, well, we have to be ready for determinants which are not Hartley Fock. And we actually have to be able to go to any order. See, Mellon Blaston only studies second order. And they proved actually that correlation shows up for the first time in the second order. You'll see it in a moment. Okay? Mellon being maybe. I don't know. Okay? Maybe not today. I don't know. All right? So that's important. Uh, so MVPT you can view as a generalization of MVPT to allow non hartley for references. So then your U will be tweaked in some way, will be not the G necessarily, and to go to arbitrary order. That's the glorious achievement of the 50s. Go from second order, leaving term correlation to all orders, and then discover all these wonderful theorems. Okay? So I guess we're now left with the one final item. You know, for perturbation theory, I need three things. K naught, you remember the formulas. W, and what? What is the third thing I need? Third operator that shows up in all these expressions. Okay? R. Hmm? Resolve it. of course. You remember, there's plenty of it there, right? So we need to know how to handle the resolvent of the amplitude operator in a metabolic case. Well, what is the reduced resolvent? It's phi n, phi n divided by kappa 0 minus kappa n. I'm just writing the original definition of it, right? OK? Well, in our case, we already know that kappa 0, our unperturbed eigenvalue, is 0. You know, this is going to be it's nice. Because no, we don't have to even remember it anymore, right? I mean, it's not like some fancy formula, OK? What about the excited eigenvalues? Well, we also know them. We already talked about it, right? If you write an n-fold, n 2 excited determinant, you end up with these kappa a1, a, sorry, i1, i n, a1, a n, which is simply a sum of epsilon a gamma minus epsilon i gamma summed over gamma from 1 to little n, OK? All right. So I'll erase this now. And now we'll finish it off. So, so now we're going to say, what is then the re So our reduced resolvent will be the f as follows. OK? What I need, you know, I'm going to follow the definition. Oh, oh, that's all I need to do. Reduce resolvent equals. I have to have a summation over all determinants other than phi zero. But I can group them according to their excitation level. You know, I can have singles, and doubles, and triples. So I'm going to split the resolvent into the many body expansion. So I'm going to have n body contributions to our resolvent running from singles to n tuple, ex n -tuple excitations, you know, if I have n uh, fermions, OK? What is each of these? n body components of the resolvent, it's a summation over determinants i1 through i n, a1 through a n, phi i1 through i n, a1 through a n, divided by denominators, which are kappa 0 minus kappa n. But kappa 0 minus kappa n, kappa 0 is 0, so there's nothing to write. OK? All I need to say is take a negative of this. OK? So I'll write it like this one. OK? But you already know what those are. They are just epsilons of occupied states minus epsilons of unoccupied states. That's all there is to it. It's just fantastically simple. Right? 
Those are your fairness and BPT denominators here. Okay, and you have the sum of course over all excited determinants or n duply excited determinants in this expression. So, okay, I have still a couple of minutes, so let me do a little manipulation of this. Okay? And that's very important. You know, some of these little things are extremely important for the rest of this class. That's going to be one of them. Okay, we know that determinants are anti-symmetric with respect to permutation of i's and a's. So if I permute i's and i's here simultaneously, and the denominator doesn't change, okay, then I get the same term. So how about if I, I, I permute all these i's in all possible ways, replace them, these inequalities here, by i's being different and a's being different. Well, to, you know, if I do this, I will have n factorial permutations here, n factorial here, so I will have 1 over n factorial squared. But I'll take one more step, and that's the key step now. I will also allow i's and a's to be identical. Why? Because we know that, of course, those determinants are zero. So I'm going to inject all the zeros. Is it clear to you? I'm going to do two things at the same time. I will consider all permutation of i's and a's, and then put a 1 over n factorial squared in front. But I will also allow i's and a's to be identical, meaning that I will actually add zeros to this expression. Okay? It looks like an innocent trick that results in an expression that looks like this. 1 over n factorial squared sum over all i values and all a values in our n body part. Oh, okay, and then we have the projection operators on the excited on, on all these excited determinants. Okay? So run this this one. Too close. You don't have to look at me. My fault. Divided by the negative of, of, of you know, by the perturbative denominator, which we already know what it is. Okay? That's an extremely important expression. Okay? I will write it one more time. Okay? Maybe here. So R0, okay? The n body part of R0 is 1 over n factorial squared. Let's give it an operator form because we're going to do many body work on it. I1 through AN, A1 through AN, you have an excitation operator, I1, IN, A1, AN, acting on T0, that's the determinant, the cat determinant. Then for the gram, okay, we'll have an adjoint form of it. So in other words, you have a dagger here, and then divided by minus kappa I1. I n a1 through a n, okay? Where the e terms, you are at them, of course, they are n duply excited elementary operators. Okay, so we have a product of x dagger a gamma, I guess, x i gamma, multiplying gammas from 1 to little n, okay? Now we have a complete set of formulas for this, okay? So the final thing, so you know, remember, so what we have is that you compute n body components of the resolvent in this way. Okay? We're summing over excited determinants. You can of course use the previous form as well, depends where we are. Okay? But I'm gonna keep this form with no constraints, rather than the original form with constraints. Okay? Uh, and then all I need to do to get the complete resolvent, I just have to add these various n body contributions. Okay? Of course, you know, in the exact theory, going from singles up to n tuples, the capital n tuples, okay? So the final expression I would like to write is, you remember, we, need, we don't just need a resolvent. You remember in these regularization terms, we always needed powers of the resolvent? Well, not always, but quite often. You know, like R0 square, R0 cube, and so on and so forth, okay? Well, we have to be ready, you know, for everything to get MVPD running. So what is the power of the resolvent then? If I want to know what is the k power of it, well, you know, if you want to know the k power of it, since these excited determinants are all orthonormal, you just have to produce k powers of each particular embodied part. So you have to just sum the r0 n and to the k, maybe I'll use also square brackets here, okay? Running from n to one, uh, uh, n, uh, little n going from 1 to capital N, okay? 
And then what is the R0, the n-body part of the resolver? In k power, all you have to do is to write this expression, okay? And as you remember, you have to simply produce k powers of the denominator. So you end up with 1 over n factorial, that's the final formula for today, sum over i1, i n, a1, a n. We have e, i1, i n, a1, a n, p0, p0, e, i1, i n, a1, a n. I'm really copying from the other blackboard. Dagger divided by the denominator minus kappa i1, i n, a1, a n, to the k. Okay, that's the only difference, that k here. Because that's because of orthogonality or ortho normality of our determinants. Okay? So I'm done, so I really can't say much more. But I would like to mention that it will be the starting point of Monday. You know, you you know, it looks like we did something very innocent, like we just added zeros, okay? Because we know that you can't occupy the same spin orbital twice. So we introduced terms which are called exclusion, the, the EPV terms, the, that is, you know, exclusion principle violating terms. We added determinants which should not be there, right? With the i's being equal and a's being equal, right? Right now it looks like we just added a bunch of zeros. So it looks like a very innocent thing to do. Well, you'll later see that it's extremely important because Lincoln Plaster theorem could not be proved if we didn't do this. If we insisted on keeping i's and a's being different, because we just wanted to insist on Pauli principle in this way, we would never be able to cancel the diagrams. Because once you start doing diagrammatic work, these EPB terms will kind of split. Some of them will go to the principal term, some of them will end up in the renormalization term. It's like you know, writing 0 as 1 minus 1. You know, 0 is 1 minus 1, but 1 will be in one term and minus 1 will be in another term. So if you don't include these EPV terms, you will never be able to see linker castle theorem. Okay? So this is a vital trick. Okay? But the logic, of course, is convenient because you already recognize that it looks like a many-body operator in second quantization, right? With N, with, in the Huberon's representation. Okay? So certainly it has that look. Okay, I have to stop right now. Uh, I need to collect the homeworks. I will read the solutions in the evening. And I'll see you on Monday and have a nice week.